Hello. Um, I don't really have an intro. I haven't worked on that yet. It's been a while since I've made a video. Um, today, I think it's a good idea to talk about something that I have a major passion for, and that is Warhammer. Uh, this, media, this video, sorry, might be a bit long form or short. I don't know. I'm recording it on the fly. And if anybody bothers to watch it, I would very much appreciate possibly liking, maybe even subscribing, and hopefully seeing some other other videos I have made. I might make more stuff in the future, but we'll see. Um, so today's topic, Warhammer. Um, I am a massive fan of Warhammer. I believe most of my videos are Warhammer, and I'd like to share that interest. So, we'll start with some basic questions that uh, most people who are getting into Warhammer often ask. And we'll start with a basic one. What is Warhammer? What is it? Um, well, Warhammer is a massive, massive franchise at this point. It's a big franchise that divides majorly into two categories. The one that I know the most of is the sci-fi one called Warhammer 40,000. But there's also a fantasy one called Age of Sigma that I'm not too proficient in, but I'm getting into it with some friends of mine. Um, so I might make a video on Warhammer Age of Sigma, possibly even the just the fantasy one, since there's the rebooted old fantasy game for it. But this video mainly is about Warhammer 40,000, which is the far more popular game. Since in the past few years, the game's been getting really simple, but also very mainstream. And because of that popularity, I think a lot of people that are getting in the game get confused with the game. And that's fair. It is, it, it is a bit confusing for people starting off. And it feels like a bit of a chore having to do your own research to find out what you think is cool in the game. So Warhammer breaks down into Warhammer 40,000 and Age of Sigmar. And today we'll be talking about Warhammer 40,000. So what is Warhammer 40,000? Also known as 40k or Warhammer 40k, it is a science fiction setting franchise thing it has a lot of different ways that you can enjoy it but ultimately it's a thing like a story or setting like um lord of the rings or game of thrones you have games you have books you have tv series hopefully a new tv series starring henry cavill of all people so that's pretty cool but it is mainly this big setting is sci-fi very grim dark very dark fantasy think if I were to compare it to anything, it's got a very medieval sense of science fiction, so very Dune-esque in a lot of the senses, and very gothic. So if, uh, these keywords, they sound weird. They might not be your thing, at least you don't think, but just give it a minute. So, all right, let's delve into the setting which I'll provide a timestamp for when I actually start talking about the game in this video, if you're only interested in playing the game. But I'd recommend possibly listening to this little bit before it so that you can get a better idea of how each faction plays in the game because it's related, but not exactly too closely related. So the setting of 40K is set in the grim darkness of the far future where there's only war. Um, and it is, like I said, a sci-fi setting with mainly humanity at just after its peak. So you see a lot of um, lore videos on YouTube or the internet, or possibly even TikTok, explaining different eras of 40k, or Warhammer the sci-fi one, such as Warhammer 40,000, Warhammer the Horus Heresy, and the Dark Age of Technology. Warhammer 40,000 happens 10,000 years after a sort of, or rather, a few, a bit more than 10,000 years after a major collapse of humanity. And 
it is a degrading society with a lot of corruption and necessary evils that are used to maintain humanity and a lot of alien and traitor different factions in the game that compete for power in the galaxy. Uh, speaking of that, who are these important characters in the setting? And what are the major factions? I'll just break it down into what, is, what you'll see in the store for Warhammer so that it's a lot easier to relate to. Under the massive banner of the Imperium Mankind, you also see a large subsector of Space Marines. They're a very popular faction. So they have their own sort of place because they're ridiculously popular. Everyone loves Space Marines, which marketing-wise and uh, generally is a good idea, but Space Marines are part of the Imperium. They're not their own thing. But, so, the Imperium is Mankind. It's the loyalist aspect of mankind who want to defend what they have against Chaos and Xenos. Chaos, on the other hand, is mankind who wants power and to conquer the galaxy. And they're sort of the bad guys or more bad guy people of the setting. Because a common thing in 40k is there isn't an explicit good and evil. Like you've seen in a lot of series, it's Shades of Grey. And chaos delves more into the aspect of doing what you want to get what you want, whereas the Imperium is doing what you have to to survive. And these two are the major powers in the galaxy, which I'll put up a map now, and you can see many of the red parts there are parts in the warp, which uh, is where which is where chaos resides. So they've spread across the galaxy in their literal storms of energy and chaos. There ergo the name chaos. But in addition to that, you have Xenos, which pretty much are all the aliens. So in short, you've got normal humans, spicy humans, and aliens. The sub-factions have their own important characters, and they have their own lore, but generally, in the Imperium, every everyone worships the Emperor of Mankind, who isn't a, he isn't a character you can play in the game, he's this religious figurehead, who's supposed to lead the Imperium, and in the Horus Heresy, he did, but now, he is being, he's been on this life support for the past 10,000 years, which is why he's viewed as a god figure, because he's functionally immortal, but he can't really control many things, so whatever happens in the galaxy happens in mysterious circumstances, all because of the Emperor. So the Emperor is a very important person. Another important person is Robu Gilliman, who is the Primarch of the Ultramarines. Uh, big word pretty much means he's this demigod warrior who's been leading mankind while the Emperor has been sort of asleep, or in this coma. And in Warhammer, there is magic. So the Emperor is this very powerful psyker, as it's called in the setting, but pretty much magician. And he used a mixture of magic and genetic tomfuckery to create these Primarchs, which Gilliman is one of. In addition, to that, which Primarchs are important, as they are also part of Chaos, but I'll get to that later. You also have Lionel Johnson, who is the Primarch of the Dark Angels. In the last sort of months of 9th edition, his model came out, which is when he returned to the setting, because all most of the Primarchs are gone. You just have the Lion and Gilliman in Warhammer, who the Lion is the administrative, so sorry, Gilliman is the more administrative commander of the Imperium, whereas the Lion is on the front lines fighting secret wars to ensure that mankind survives. Other important characters in the setting are also Trajan Valdoris, who is the current Captain General of this major Ultra Guard that protects the Earth and the Solar System, called the Adepti Adeptus Custodes. God, I'm just tricking out. But they're the personal bodyguards of the Emperor, and they ensure that Earth or Terra, Holy Terra, as it's known in the setting, is protected. He helps Gilliman and is also um, 
major part of the political sphere there. In addition to that, you have certain chapter masters who are very important in the setting, such as Marnius Calgar, who's the chapter master of the Ultramarines. He leads them, and the Ultramarines are a very prestigious chapter. They are the poster boys of the setting. When you walk into the Warhammer store, you see the big blue guy with a massive assault rifle. That's an Ultramarine. That is an Ultramarine Space Marine, and they're the poster boys. Um, you also have this other chapter master called Commander Dante, who leads the Blood Angels, who have their own little section in the Warhammer store. And he's this guy in golden armor with a jetpack who's been alive for a really long time. But pretty much while Gilliman and Marnius Calgar kind of... Marnius Calgar leads the Ultramarines, whereas Gilliman is more in charge of the Imperium. Gilliman leads the Imperium and keeps it safe on the left side of the galaxy, where the big red fucking line is cutting across. Whereas Commander Dante does the same thing on the right-hand side of the galaxy. So that's why it's important. You also have a lot of named characters, such as Castellan Ursula Creed, who's the daughter of Castellan Creed, who was the uh, Castellan of the Cadian Regiment by the time Cadia fell. And Cadia's an important world because it was fending off the massive red line. So at one point, it was just the Eye of Terror. And when Abaddon, who's another name, destroyed Cadia, that, mass, that, that little dot in the middle became the giant line. So that's why it's important. And Ursula Creed is a named character because she leads the Cadian Regiment and is a very good military commander. Same with Lord Solar Leontus, who is a High Lord of Terra. So you have a lot of names and characters that do their own things in the setting. But that's just in the Imperium. On the other hand, trying to take down the Imperium, you have Chaos. The War Master of Chaos and the current leader is Ezekiel Abaddon, also known as just Abaddon the Despoiler. And there's he's an old, old figure who's existed for about 10,000 years in the setting. And he fought in the Horus Heresy, and he currently leads this massive legion called the Black Legion who they have pretty much, they don't care about much, but they generally just want the Imperium gone. And he leads them as well as leading most of Chaos. In addition to that, you have the four major named characters for each almost representative legion for each one of the Chaos Gods. You have, I'm a Death Guard player, so... For Death Guard, who are the Legion of Plagues and Disease, that serve the Chaos God Nurgle, you have Typhus, or Chaos Typhon, who is the champion of Nurgle, and the Primarch that leads that faction is Mortarion. Um, then World Eaters, who also came out in 9th edition, so they're a relatively new-ish faction, but also have been around for old time in the lore, with a couple models in just normal Chaos Space Marines, which are the bad guys. Um, you have Karn the Betrayer, who serves as the herald of the god of war and slaughter, Korn. And the Primarch for that legion is Angron, massive red demon, very cool model. Um, then for Thousand Sons, who serve the Chaos God of Magic, Scheming, and Deceit, which is Zinch, you have Araman, who is a high sorcerer of the Thousand Suns, who doesn't like his Primarch, Magnus the Red, which is a giant red cyclops bird person, who is a second to the Emperor, or God Emperor of Mankind in magical ability. So he's a very good, good, very good magician, like, ridiculous, like, you can think of your head exploding and the entire planet shattered because he had a slightly wrong thought. Levels of broken. And last but not least, they don't have their own sub-faction. They are more like, as of current, which is the beginning of 2024, 10th edition, Emperor's Children, who are the legion dedicated to the Chaos God of Lost Pleasure and Excess, Slanesh, 
they are attached to normal Chaos Space Marines, but it's theorized that they might get their own individual sub faction, like Death Guard, Thousand Sons, and World Leaders. The champion of Slanesh is Lucius the Eternal, and the Primarch is Fulgrim. So that covers all the four major flavors of Chaos and the largest Chaos undivided faction in Chaos. Additionally, you have demons and other Chaos Space Marine factions, such as Iron Warriors, who I love so much, they're cool, or Red Corsairs with Huron Blackheart, who is also a major named character. But these are all the main figureheads and characters in Chaos. The gods don't do much, they sit back and have their representatives do stuff, but these are the representatives. And in Xenos, you have a lot of they're their own individual factions, but they're much smaller in scale. So think of them like separate imperiums with their own sub-factions and leaders, but they're just really, really tiny compared to the Imperium. For example, Necrons, you have named characters such as Imotech the Stormlord, who leads the... Um, I can't remember the name of the dynasty, but they used to be the normal one before Caesaric, the Silent King, came back to lead the Caesarian dynasty. And then you have... People in the Necrons, such as um, Illuminar Caesarus, who is a sort of like, not bounty hunter, but he's a scientist, so he doesn't have an allegiance. He just wants to do science, like Vlado, sort of. And you also have um, Trace of the Infinite and um, Oric and the Diviner. They, they are all part of the Necrons. The Necrons are these undead robot skeletons. They were the major bad guy faction in 9th edition, but now in 10th edition, it's Tyranids. And sorry that I'm a bit short on the aliens, it's just there's a lot of aliens to cover. So that's Necrons. Um, and I'll give a quick recap on their flavors, on how they play and what they are. But Tyranids, on the other hand, they don't have named character. They're a swarm, sort of hive mind faction. Think Zerg from StarCraft. And... I guess one of their major characters, quote unquote, is the Swarm Lord, who is just this ultra predator bug thing, who is, every time he dies, his memories are taken back to this overarching commanding thing called the Hive Mind, like, like the Overmind, the Hive Mind commands all the Tyranids, and, um, the Swarm Lord when he dies goes back there and then comes back because they respawn. So their gimmick is that they're the unending horde army, which is a term you'll hear a lot describing armies. Similar to that, you have orcs, who they have some named characters, some major named characters, because uh, previous to 7th edition, 6th and 5th edition, I believe orcs were some major villains, and you'd see them everywhere. They're generally the anarchists of 40k. Greenskins, bigger, dumber, but also covered in muscle. They are led by either, if you're part of the undivided orc pirate faction, you'd have Captain Badrook, or if you're being, or if you're part of the sneaky orcs, which I believe are, uh, the name Blood Axis is coming to mind, but I don't think so. Probably Snake Bites, I don't know. You'd have um, uh, Snake Rot, who is a very known character, didn't have a model to recently. The major character for orcs is, um, um, oh no, I'm blanking. The major character for orcs is Gasgul Thrak. He is this massive, massive, massive orc. The size of Gilman, or Abaddon. Massive character. And he has this little assistant called Makari. And their whole thing is that Gasgul Thrak is the prophet of the Wag. So the orc gods, Gork and Mork, have bestowed upon him unimaginable power. And this sort of blessing slash curse that he will always be in orc war zones. But when the fighting's done, he disappears and leaves another war zone, which leads to the orcs seeing him as a coward who runs away at the last second or at the end of the battle. So that leaves him, because he's bigger, he's more powerful, and he's also smarter than other orcs, he's almost depressed in a sense because he can't actually be there for the orcs. And... His only friend, who is this Grot, who every time he dies, a new one takes his place and slowly becomes the same Grot, Makari, 
keeps dying. Sometimes killed by Gaskell, other times killed in war, but that's his only friend. And uh, the major faction thing for orcs is that you have normal orcs and the beast snaggers, which are the model line that released in none, and they're a big melee horde army. Moving on from orcs, you have got Eldar, which branch off into Dark Eldar, Craft World Eldar, and Dinari, which are a mix of both. Starting with Craft World Eldar, also just called the Eldari, or Iron, not Iron Den, but like just Craft World Eldar. They are very weak, very fragile, but very magical. Lots of magic. So if you love magic, they're your faction. They use long ranged weaponry and are semi elite in a sense, since they have unique units that do a certain thing. So, for example, they have their normal guardian squads, which just have guns and maybe a gun platform, and they sit around. But then you have these specialist units, such as Dark Reapers, led by their specialist unit leader, Morgan Ra, who are the shooting death guys, and they're very good at shooting. And then you can have something like the um, Swooping Hawks, led by Baron. Old, fucking old models. But their whole thing is that they have like aerial assaults with little wing jetpack things, and they dive down, and they have their guns, and fly around. Or you can have stuff like Howling Banshees, led by Jane Zarr. So for normal Eldar, main characters would be um, each of the Phoenix Lords, which are the guys that lead them. They're called Phoenix Lords, I think. Um, the ones I named Jane Zar, Baharoth, Morgan Ra. They aren't tied to a craft world, per se, which are the sub factions of Eldar. More than they sort of go around trying to save craft worlds. And the way that they work is that their armor is possessed by their soul. So whenever, like Makari, whenever someone becomes the new uh, Phoenix Lord of the Dark Reapers, they slowly become Mog and Ra and lose their personality. Which is cruel, but also necessary. At the same time, you also have just leaders of different sub-factions, like, I believe, Illich Nightspear of Iandin, who now leads the, the, uh, the, the, the Corsairs, which are this weird... Us. They're 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 not a sub faction. They're just like another specialist unit, but not in the same sense as the already specialist units of the Eldar. So if you are indecisive on how you want to play an army, definitely recommend Eldar because they have everything down pat. You have melee with howling howling banshees and striking scorpions. You've got range with dark reapers, uh, dire avengers. Mm. Um, and yeah, they're very interchangeable. Lots of different color palettes and. Great constructs. On the other hand, you have Dark Eldar, who are the complete and polar opposite of that. Instead of having a unified faction with different aspects that they can bring together, they have three major divisive things. Which I remember in 9th edition, you used to either be able to bring one, or the other, or the other, or a mix of all three. And they played completely different. So you have your, like, Cabalite warriors, you have your homunculus and their monsters, and then you have the witches and all that stuff. Major characters for Dark Eldar are Lilith Hesperax, really, because she leads the witches and is a master duelist. And Drazar, who is suspected to be a former Phoenix Lord from the normal Eldari, but then became a Dark Eldar. So the difference between Dark Eldar and normal Eldar is that because they're all all their souls are cleaned by Slanesh, they have to figure out a way to ensure that their souls don't get pretty much consumed when they die. Craft World Eldar have their craft worlds and soul stones. When you die, your soul gets trapped in stone. They plug that stone into a little computer called an infinity circuit, I believe, and you get an artificial afterlife. Your soul's fine. Dark Eldar, on the other hand, are the opposite end of the problem of instead of trying to figure out a way of saving your soul when you die, you just try not to die. So that's why their homunculuses can bring them back to life. And they need to be quick about it or else the souls are plain. So they just try not to die and they rejuvenate themselves through the pain of others. Thus why they have the sharp pointy torture vibes. And both of these factions, Dark Eldar don't have magic. They're more piratey, more melee, but they're also a lot more like buffs and weird stuff. 
On the other hand, Eldar are a lot more vanilla in the sense of it's very basic, you get what you're getting, and you can customize it however you want. The mix of both is the Yunari, led by Ivrain, and guided by the Viziarch, and they also have worked together to try and bring back the Eldar God of Death, the Incarnate. And Eldar also have gods, similar to the gods of Warp, Nurgle, Horn, God of War, that stuff. Um, not the game, but like the god of war in the game. So they have their gods, but most of them are dead because of the gods of the warp. But the two that you can play in the game, as the Inari, you can play with the Incarnate, the Incarnate as a model. And as Eldari, you can bring the Avatar of Cain onto the battlefield as a playable model. So yeah, they're cool. Um, covered almost all the Xenos factions. The newest, weirdest one is Leaks of Votan. They used to be around a while ago, years ago, under the manner of Squats, as a sub-faction of the Imperium, but now they're their own thing. And there's not much lore on them, because they've only really been out for a little while, but generally, you have, I believe, um, the way they work is that they're more advanced humans that have cloned themselves to the point that they're squatty dwarves. They like mining, so think Deep Rock Galactic. Named characters, they, I don't think they really have any. They have one, they have one, but the alternate build for him is just the basic captain guy that leads the army, or the named character. Um, their gimmick is being a super elite army, so they have very, very, very small model count, with very good weapons. And then last but not least, in the Xenos, uh, I think is the Tau. So the Tau are a big gunline faction. Horrible, horrible melee. Lots of guns and lots of gun dumps. So they have these big mech suits and a lot of like suits and AI and drones. So they're interesting. They're also they also are a very small empire that believe in the greater good, is what they call it, which is this philosophy of everything you do should help as many people as possible. They're the most good, good guys of the setting, except they're led by these things called Ethereals, who are a variant of Tau that have the ability to brainwash you and are very good politicians. They're Tau divided into different castes, such as Firecast for the Army, Earthcast for Engineering, Watercast for Politics, Aircast for the Air Force. And then, yeah, you have ethereal cast for ethereals. Um, named characters, you have two ethereals. I think Onva and Onchi, old models, but they're ethereals for your basic Tau. Commander Shadow Sun also worked for basic Tau, but I believe she is from a very specific Tau sect, as they're called. Tenth edition isn't too uh, like too much of a strickler on this, so you can bring her with orange color Tau, even though she has a white color too for the white faction, but it's fine. But 9th edition used to be a bit... Mm. And... Last but not least, you have Commander Farsight, who is this sort of rebel leader in the eyes of the Tau, but he has this red mech suit and defies the Tau by being a good melee warrior and ranged warrior. And he leads this little personal guard called the Eight. Or, no, sorry, the Eight. So there are eight guys that have these suits that are really good. Flavor for Tau is big, gunline, Mechs, accompanied by foot soldiers. So that generally covers the major factions and the important characters. Um, sorry for the big rant, but there's a lot of stuff in Warhammer. There's a lot, a lot. The setting's been alive for close to half a century now. 40 years. We just celebrated a 40-year anniversary, so it's a lot. Um, and it's a very diverse setting. There's usually something here that you'll like, and it's a lot of fun. But next question, because I've just gave you all this information, how does that relate to the game? Why do I care? Why do I care? I just want to play a board game. Well, here's the thing. Um, all these characters that I've named, you can play as in this game. 
and the gimmicks that they reflect in their factions are generally how the faction plays in the game because they have different armies that have different styles that work in different ways which is why i say there's usually something here for you it's a war it's a tabletop war game which means you need to be tactical and you need to know how to manage your units and something called command points which is your like currency to spend on ploys upgrades things like that and so knowing about these guys how they work and how the faction works will have you'll have more fun playing the game because you won't be trying to throw guys that don't have melee weapons into a meat grinder that is 10 orcs or you won't be trying to do precise sharpshooting with a guy who's pretty much equipped with a pistol and a chainsaw. So it'll help you, one, pick a good sub faction to play in the game and to actually play them well. So what games are there? Because there's a lot of sub factions, and yes, there are a lot of games. Um, the main one is just Warhammer 40,000. The 10th edition just came out. There was a box set that released for it, but they also have starter sets. The best thing to do is probably get one of those starter sets, read through the rules, and play a couple of practice games with the models in those box sets. And then maybe look at a combat patrol to actually pick what faction you want to play. And that's usually the best way to get into Warhammer 40,000, the game, because it's a very mainline popular game. It's the most popular tabletop war game. But um, the other games that exist are Necromunda, which is a smaller scale game where you focus on gangs on the world of Necromunda. There is Kill Team, which is also a skirmish game, but more set in the 40k setting. So you play these little elite squads of people that have a different playstyle and there are different operatives. So they move one guy at a time, as opposed to 40k where it's units. So you don't actually have an army, you have like one unit of operatives then you also have horus heresy which is supposed to take place ten thousand years during the age of the horus heresy and there's a bunch of lore for that which probably could constitute its own video there are lore videos there were so if you're interested in the horus heresy search up the horus heresy and you'll find battle reports lore videos that explain it because it's a much more rich setting than 40k because 40k is continuing whereas horus heresy ends when the heresy ends so you can only go so far so they add depth um yeah so mainly though 40k probably what he came here for timestamp here uh how 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 do you play warhammer 40,000 well there's a lot of tutorials that teach you the mechanics of the game such as the command phase moving shooting but generally to play the game you need dice, a tape measure in inches, because the game uses inches to move, and models to play with. You don't need the GW models. They're a bit pricey. That's an understatement. They're very expensive. But ultimately, that's the stuff you need. You need a battlefield with terrain to hide behind and run around. You need these dice to roll, because it's a tabletop game. And you need the tape measure to see how far your guys can move and how far they can shoot. The, um, the game generally is divided into these little phases. So, and it's a you go, I go game. So one person will have their army do everything in all their phases. Kill guys, move, take objectives. And then it'll swap to your turn or the other guy. And you'll do all your stuff in the order. There's an order that the phases go in. You have the command phase, which is when you figure out what the fuck you're doing, right? You get stratagems, which allow special guys to do special things. You get command points so that you can actually do those things. You can use abilities, and you can use this and that. And it's kind of like the setup to what you're about to do, right? So your command phase, you command around your guys. You figure out what rules you want to use and how you want to play your army at the, at like the time, right? You figure out what your major tactic is. And in the movement phase, that's when you start moving. You don't charge to get into combat, which is the only way to get into combat besides a uh, stratagem called heroic intervention, which allows you to charge within six inches. If a unit charges you, that's getting a bit too depth. But um, 
you move your guys in the moon phase. And generally, um, you can also choose to advance guys, which is done, you take a dice, you roll it, you add the number that you, or the value that you get in the dice to the movement that they can move, and they move. That often restricts shooting because you're running. So running with a machine gun can run and gun like Rambo. Um, and yeah, so that's when you start moving. Shooting phase is when you use guns and now magic as well to kind of cast spells, long range spells to kill guys and shoot guys down with artillery, cannons, guns, all that stuff. Um, the way it's done, usually things have a ballistic skill, which is the value you need to achieve or, sur or surpass. To classify as a hit with a number of dice given under an attack value labeled as A on a data sheet. Um, you then roll to wound, comparing strength of the weapon, toughness of the target, and according to that, you'll figure out if you need five or greater or three or greater, depending on how likely you are to wound it with a weak weapon, a strong weapon. Uh, yeah. And then the target that you're shooting at will roll to see if they can tank the shot on their armor, right? And armor penetration that a weapon has makes their armor worse because it penetrates their armor, no shit. But um, yeah, generally that's the way it goes. Roll to hit, roll to wound, they roll to save. And if they succeed the save, it's fine. If they fail to save, they take damage. All the models in the unit, or a model, will have a certain amount of wounds to your health, which wounds it can take. So if something does like, I don't know, one damage and your guy has one health and he got shot in the head because he failed his save, he takes one point of damage, which completely gets rid of his only wound of health and he dies. Very self-explanatory. Um, weapons also in 40k have keywords such as precision, hazard, blast. But they're, if you go into the core rulebook, you can find what they all mean. But I'm pretty sure the rules are free online, so you can also search them up. And if not, there are online resources that can help you. Um, so yeah, that's the shooting phase. You shoot weapons, certain weapons do certain things, other certain weapons do other certain things, and you kill stuff at range. Then, after the shooting phase, you have a charge phase, which happens right before you actually fight. Because the only way to get into combat in Warhammer is to charge. Normally, in the move phase, you're not allowed to move within one inch of a model. So it's like there's a one-inch little protective circle that you can't just step into. No matter how close you are, you have to charge to get in or heroically intervene if the circumstances are right. And so this is what that phase is for. Because what, let's say you're like seven inches away from a guy and you want to stab him. You need to reach that guy to stab him. So to roll, you roll for a charge to see if your guy can run up to him and stab him. And that's done by taking two dice and rolling and seeing if the value you got is equal to or greater than the distance you need to reach. If it's greater, great, you charged. Amazing. And then on charge effects and certain rule effects will pop off. They'll happen. Or maybe you'll get fight first or fight last. We'll see. And you charge all your guys. Because once you're done charging, you start the fight phase, which is when you actually do the fighting and killing. Very similar to the shooting in mechanics, where you take a dice, roll to hit, compare the strength with the top of the guy, and then AP to dictate if their armor can withstand the amount of armor penetration that your weapon does, and see if their armor protects them. So, yeah, it's pretty much the same as shooting with very similar keywords. Except you don't have to roll to see if you're in range with the gun. You're just in melee. If you're not in melee, you can't use a knife. And at the end of that fight phase, once all fights are concluded, because you can have different fights going on, like you can have, let's say, 10 assault intercessors going up against, uh, I don't know, some, le some five legionaries because a tank shot them. And then at the same time, you can have like a big monster that's about to charge into your guys and they're in fight, but the fight hasn't started yet. So you can have separate engagements going on. And once they're all done, it's the leadership phase or the morale phase, I believe. 
which is when you roll to see if your guys like break under the pressure of having lost guys around them or maybe they need to do a leadership check because something is triggered it like a plague versus mortar right so that's the phase of the game and a person will do those those phases in that order then you reply with that and the other person will do that for about five times each and by the end of that fifth time you check to see what prerequisites of the game are met and they'll give certain points the person with the most points wins so that's how you play the game and online you can search up battle reports for 40k which shows you people playing the game which will give you a good idea of how the game actually plays and stuff like that fantastic channel to actually go and see is a channel called play on tabletop because they're really good editing and they do it within an hour which warhammer takes a while to play so having it in less than an hour just to be able to understand how the game plays and looks and everything is fantastic so yeah that's the game of course in addition to that you yeah the game plays like that but certain sub factions and factions like i mentioned before in the lore section uh have different gimmicks and what methods in the way they play and if you adhere more to them you're more likely to win and that's used to why some people pick their sub factions and yeah that's just part of like the tactical aspect of warhammer which is a tabletop war game where you have to be strategic and tactical so hopefully now you should be asking how do i join in to playing like warhammer well there's there are i think three main real easy ways to get in the first is just find a friend who also is somewhat interested in it get a box set split the armies play the game and then go on for those armies that's definitely one fantastic way to do it or if someone already plays the game ask them to give you a tutorial or that you're going to collect something and you'd like to play against them that's that works that's amazing that's a great way to get into games how i got into game and you'll start finding people and friends that play warhammer very very quickly then the other way is that you can try this like it's on steam called tabletop simulator it's a lot of a lot of more competitive players use it to test out army lists and army builds to see if that's a good army that synergizes well, that plays well. But you can also get that game for about 14 bucks on Steam or Australian dollars, because some in Australia now. Um, or get another guy to get the game, and then you can download those models online so they can play them online. That's definitely a hundred percent a way to do it. Uh I, I like the tabletop aspect because I like painting them, but completely up to you and last but not least of course you have just going to a local either the warhammer store which they have their own stores with warhammer written in white on the top or going to a local game or hobby store that sells these miniatures normally they'll have like some tables and stuff like that and if you ask one of the staff there they should be able to help you hell you should probably just see some two guys already playing a game and ask hey can i like i'm trying to get into warhammer do you mind if I watch or do you mind if I like ask you some questions or do you mind if I play with this army against you next time? And then they'll probably say yes, because 40k we don't gatekeep too much. But sometimes we do. Be careful. But um yeah, you absolutely go to go to a hobby store, ask questions, and people should be more than happy to help you. Especially now, actually. Now's a really good time to get in these past few years, because the game's been getting so much more mainstream. So you have a lot more new players coming in. You're not going to find a lot of sweaty neckbeards that are all about getting the best rules and uh, min-maxing with the most efficient like army combos and synergies. You'll probably just find other people who have armies and want to play. So those are the three main ways that you can actually get into the game. So, of course, where can you find Warhammer? Hobby stores, 100%. Usually a hobby store will have it because Warhammer is super popular, especially Warhammer 40,000. Very popular. Go to um, game stores, hobby stores, search up Warhammer online. There's a, there's a website that the online store is where most people get their models, and you can see the prices for models. Um, you can see the models for the different games, but also 
just going into one of those stores is fantastic because that's where you can find it. And in addition, going into the stores is where you can find people that play it. So that's great. Now we get into the section of should you play? Because that's a big thing. Warhammer is it's a ridiculously fun hobby. Some people love it to bits, some people love other tabletop games, but got into tabletop through Warhammer. Some people absolutely love Warhammer, but now branching off to Age of Sigmar, Warhammer, and doing all this stuff. It's great. It's a social game. You get to just sit around with friends, and it takes up like maybe even a whole evening or a whole day if you have a battle that's big enough. And it's a big event, and the spectacle of it is amazing to walk, and it's fun to play, and you interact, and it's great. But it's also pretty expensive it's not a hobby that you can go into very easily as a kid unless you have quite a lot of disposable income so should you play and if you do should you bring your friends it's a very individual opinion so if you're getting into warhammer maybe go into one of their stores and ask around for the price ask around about the game and then make your decision but try make a smart and educated decision on the game because if you just kind of go in thinking what's the worst that can happen, you are going to burn a lot of money. So um, genu genuinely sit down and ask yourself, are you interested in spending three to five hours at a time to play this game with a person? To socialize and interact, possibly chill, have some drinks, uh, have some snacks, and just have fun. Are you willing to do that? That's a major, major question. Because it, 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 it I, and I don't mean to make it sound like it's a big, like, familial commitment, like, are you ready to have a son? But, um, it is a bit of a commitment because you don't get the models like you see in the box because they're models. You have to take them off the sprue, clean them up, assemble them, paint them, put them on a base, base them, and then you have to do it for every single one. And some people hate that. It's tedious. But other people really do love it. So, 100%, ask yourself, are you willing to set aside hours of your day to paint guys? Because some people love it. It's a, it's a relaxing thing. Are you willing to relax for hours of a day or hours of a day? Just painting at least one guy or five guys or ten guys, depending on how your quality and batch painting. And are you willing to do that for an army? And are you willing to take that army to face other armies? For all, multiple hours, you know, because it, it's a hobby. It's a brand new hobby that you're going to start. And if you want to get into it with friends, you should 100% ask yourself, do you think your friends are also going to have that interest? Do they also have that niche? Because if they don't, you're going to find that you're left with a big expensive army that you can't really field against anyone or anything else because you don't know anyone else. Which is why the hobby stores is the best way to do it because there'll always be someone interested because they're in the store for a fucking reason. Go play with them. So yeah, um, hundred percent. Ask yourself: Are you willing to commit to painting and assembling and doing this for your army? Because you don't have to, but it's better. It's more, I know. See, I know it's a tabletop game, but for me, it's a lot more immersive because you actually get to delve into the setting of the character, especially when they do something ridiculous like. Oh, wow, a tank just blasted his head off, and he's still running at it. It's really funny. But yeah, ask yourself if you're willing to commit to that, and genuinely consider, are your friends going to do it as well? Or ask your friends if they are going to do it as well. And if you get a yes from both sides, then you know you're going to have two Warhammer players, and it's going to be fun. But if you're the only one interested, or if they're the only one interested, and you're not too iffy on it, you're going to be wasting quite a lot of money. So yeah, I really hope this video is useful. I hope it gets views, but also I hope that people can use it to learn about the setting, learn about the game, because it's a fun, fun game and I love its bits and monetization. So thank you, thank you. If you watched to the end, if you watched all of it especially, all, what the 49 minutes of it, Jesus Christ. I don't know. If you watched all of it, Absolutely, thank you, thank you so much. Um, if you only watched the game section, also thank you. If you watched any section, thank you. Um, 
good luck on your hobbying adventures. Enjoy, have fun. That's the big thing. But also, play well. And yeah, thanks for watching. Rock and roll.